Hey everybody, it's Dr. Johnny and welcome to my webinar, Why a Top Nutritionist Eats Bacon. Surprising, right? Well, stick with me for the next half hour and maybe you'll rethink some of the assumptions you have about bacon, about saturated fat, about heart disease, and about all the other things that have to do with your surprise that someone like me would eat bacon and advocate it. Okay, well, this is me. This is my office staff. You'll see them again at the very end when I always show a picture of my family. And um, I like bacon. I like it a lot for a number of reasons, one of which is the taste, but others of which you might be surprised to find are the benefits to energy and hormones and uh, metabolism and some of the other things we'll talk about much later on after we get rid of some of the objections that everybody has to bacon. So let's talk about these objections and let's see if we can uh, dig a little bit deeper, look a little bit under the hood and see whether they really hold up. So there's basically four objections to eating bacon. The first is saturated fat. Oh my God, there's saturated fat in there and we all know what that does. It raises your cholesterol and we know what that does. It leads to heart disease. Okay, we're going to talk about all that. The third objection has to do with nitrates. And uh, there's something to this, and we're going to get into it. It's not what you may think, but there is something there worth talking about. And number four is animal products are bad. There's something there worth talking about as well. But let's dig in a little bit deeper and see what we've really got. And I believe very strongly that when you study the assumptions behind the assumptions, that's when you really start to get uh, gold. And that's what we're going to do. So let's first look at what is bacon. What's in it to begin with? What's all this stuff that we're so afraid of? Well, as you see, there's very little cholesterol in it, and we'll get to that in a minute. But what I want you to notice here is that there isn't even that much saturated fat in there to begin with. Most of the fat in bacon is monounsaturated fat. Look at that label. Monounsaturated fat is the lion's share of the fat, and that's the same fat that's found in olive oil. So that's number one. Uh, the number two, and probably more important than any of that, is that there's been a spate of studies recently, especially in the last five years, that have questioned the connection between fat and heart disease, particularly between saturated fat and heart disease. Um, this is now being really questioned, not quite as much by the mainstream as I'd like to see it, but you're seeing a, a very what was once a very small minority of health professionals who questioned this for many, many years has been coming to the fore, and you're hearing these arguments more and more and more, and, and the idea that saturated fat causes heart disease is just not holding up. Uh, it kind of started um, in recent times anyway in, with this 2010 study in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition where they basically looked at all of the studies that connected saturated fat and cholesterol and heart disease, and they said, let's take cholesterol out of the mix and let's just see whether eating saturated fat really has any effect on the endpoint we really care about, which is heart disease, and guess what they found? It didn't. There is no significant evidence for concluding that dietary saturated fat is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Sorry, they just couldn't find any connection. Next study came out 2014 in the Annals of Internal Medicine. Same thing. Couldn't find a connection between saturated fat and heart disease. Sorry. This is a great article that was done um, <clears throat> where he actually looked at all of the advice that all of the major health organizations give us regarding fat. And he found that the results and conclusions about saturated fat in relation to cardiovascular disease from all the leading advisory committees just doesn't reflect the available science. It's just not true. Sorry. Uh, most uh, This is another article in British Medical Journal. <clears throat> saturated fat is not the major issue. No kidding. And it goes on to say... Um, uh, that the mantra that saturated fat must be removed to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease has dominated dietary advice for almost four decades, yet scientific evidence shows that this advice has paradoxically increased our cardiovascular risks. So, uh, how did we get this whole thing wrong? How do we get so fearful of saturated fat in the first place? Well, it kind of starts with the work and the perseverance of a physiologist named Ansel Keys, uh, who was absolutely bound and determined to prove his hypothesis that heart disease was caused by saturated fat. So he, he took data from these six countries, Japan, Italy, England, Australia, Canada, and U.S., and, and he plotted them out on a graph, and he went before the uh, the uh, 
um, World Health Organization, and he presented this data, and he said, look, it's very, very clear. The more percentage of dietary fat in the diet, the greater the risk of heart disease. There it is. It's clear as a bell. Well, he met with a little bit of protest from the scientists, partly because there was actually data for 22 countries. It was available at the time that Ansel Keys presented this data. And when you show all the 22 countries for which there was data, pretty hard to draw a straight line between them. If you were confused, let me show those to you side by side. Uh, you can't really draw a straight line showing that the percent of calories from fat has anything to do with anything when you include all of the countries and you don't just show the countries that prove your hypothesis. So Ansel Keys went on to design a study which has been probably the most quoted study in nutritional epidemiology ever conceived. It's called the Seven Country Study. He picked countries that he was pretty sure we're going to prove his hypothesis. He ignored data that didn't fit with the hypothesis. I don't believe this study could even be published today. It would be just savaged on the internet. But at the time, he got it through. It was highly respected, and it has been used to bolster this notion that saturated fat causes heart disease, and it's been used for probably the last 40 years. Um, I, I love this particular slide. Picks data that supports the idea that fat is bad and causes the obesity epidemic because just fast forward for a second, I don't want to go too far off on a tangent here, but what did we replace all that good traditional fat with? Sugar and processed carbohydrates. Case closed. So uh, I, I presented this at the American College of Nutrition. It didn't meet with a lot of uh, laughs, but I'm going to show it to you anyway. I love this t-shirt. Ansel Keys, destroying good health with bogus science since 1953. Okay, maybe that's a little cruel. Uh, but it's worth pointing out that you can make the data say anything you wanted to. Malcolm Kendrick, a great doctor out in, 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 um, <clears throat> in England, uh, wrote a book called The Great Cholesterol Con. And one of the clever things that he did in there was he just picked different countries. And by picking different countries, he could show that lower rates of heart disease were associated with higher levels of saturated fat in the diet, meaning the more saturated fat you ate, the less heart disease you had. You, know, you could really make the data show anything that you wanted to. But Ansel Keys made the data show that saturated fat was the culprit. And we've been suffering with, those, uh, with the advice based on that ever since. So, um, this led to what's called the diet heart hypothesis, which is that dietary saturated fat, and in some versions, dietary cholesterol, raises cholesterol and therefore contributes to the risk of heart disease. Uh, even if you haven't heard of the diet heart hypothesis, you certainly, um, <clears throat> it's, it's certainly colored all the advice that most major medical organizations and dietary organizations have been giving us, you know, since, certainly since I've been an adult. <clears throat> And of course, uh, Ansel Keys' views became accepted. Uh, there's a cover of Time magazine that goes back into the uh, 1980s. Uh, cholesterol, now the bad news, and of course bacon was implicated in that, as were egg yolks and all the rest of the stuff that was believed to cause uh, 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 heart disease. Um, it's worth pointing out that George Mann, who was one of the actual researchers at the Framingham study, uh, found this to be utter nonsense and caused, uh, it said the dietary fat is not the determinant of either cholesterolemia nor coronary heart disease, and it, he called it the greatest scam ever perpetrated on the American public. But voices like George Men's were kind of shouted down, and these guidelines were accepted by just about everybody, and we've been hearing about how bad saturated fat and cholesterol are ever since. Okay, so... Uh, Fast forward, Walt Willett, probably the most famous nutritional epidemiologist of all time, the head of the uh, uh, Department of uh, Nutrition at, um, <clears throat> um, at Harvard School of Public Health, uh, and he said, we have found virtually no relationship between the percentage of calories from fat and any important health outcome. Now, Will it? I don't agree with 100% because he still thinks saturated fat is a bad fat, but he was uh, the first to say, look, we've studied this stuff for 30 years, the nurses' health study, the health professionals' uh, follow-up study, just isn't, fat is just not related to anything, sorry. And of course, here's Time Magazine, I always get a kick out of this, in, like 20, 30 years later, a complete reversal, eat butter, uh, scientists label fat the enemy, why they were wrong. Okay, so what's the takeaway? The takeaway is, number one, saturated fat does not cause heart disease. And number two, most of the fat and bacon isn't even saturated fat. The whole thing is just preposterous. Most of the fat and bacon is monounsaturated fat. And even if it were saturated fat, it doesn't really matter because it doesn't cause heart disease. Okay, so now let's talk about cholesterol. What about eating cholesterol? There is some cholesterol in bacon. Well, 
the the notion that eating cholesterol has anything to do with anything has been just turned on its head. This is a wonderful article by Dr. Chris Masterjohn, who it's a little technical, but you can certainly find it. He has a wonderful blog called cholesterolandhealth.com. Um, and he points out, as the research points out from time, you know, just there's a, quite a bit of research on this, that dietary cholesterol doesn't do a thing a, a serious thing to blood cholesterol. Now, whether blood cholesterol matters or not, we're going to talk about in a minute, but eating cholesterol does not really have any major effect on blood cholesterol levels at all. Um, now, what about cholesterol in the blood? Is that something we should worry about? Well, I'm not so sure. Let's look at some of these studies. Here's a study that uh, looked at patients who were hospitalized with coronary artery disease. 136,000 people they looked at, and guess what? Almost half of them had perfectly normal cholesterol levels. Cholesterol doesn't even predict heart disease very well. Here's another study in, in people older than 70. Lack of association between cholesterol and coronary heart disease. It's, it happens time and time again. Here's another one, a review of observational studies in, in 80 plus year olds. And so many of these people are on statin drugs to lower their cholesterol and it doesn't even matter. Here's yet another study in JAMA, which is probably the most conservative and respected medical journal in America. What does it say? It says that uh, the majority of patients in this group, and this is a group of patients who were treated surgically for atherosclerosis, okay? The majority of patients in this group had serum cholesterol values within the accepted normal range for Americans. So cholesterol doesn't even predict heart disease. So what's the takeaway here? Cholesterol in the diet doesn't matter a whit, and number two, cholesterol in the blood is a lousy predictor of heart disease. So we've just kind of demolished the two big connections to heart disease for bacon, which is saturated fat and cholesterol. Sorry, just doesn't make much of a difference. Now let's get into the nitrates. This is rather interesting, um, and it's so badly understood by most people. So Yes, there's lots of nitrates that are used in processed meat. And by the way, I don't recommend any of these meats. I, you will never see me eat salami or bologna or hot dogs or any of this crap. It's all horrible. It's got tremendously high rates of sodium. It's the worst kind of factory farmed meat. And yes, it does have extra nitrates, but that's really not the big problem here. Um, so, and these, these things have been associated with higher risks of cancer. Okay, so let's talk about what really happens with nitrates. Now, the, the first thing you ought to know is that the main source of nitrates in our diet is actually vegetables. There's more nitrates in green leafy vegetables than there are in bacon. So there's tons of nitrates in vegetables, and guess what? They're not bad for you, and here's why. See, nitrates have an interesting uh, trajectory in terms of their metabolism. Start with a nitrate, which is uh, three atoms of oxygen and one of nitrogen, and then it gets reduced, it becomes nitric oxide, uh, it becomes a nitrite, excuse me, which is two uh, um, atoms of oxygen and one of nitrogen. And then it turns into a miraculous molecule called nitric oxide. Uh, those of you who want to skip ahead a little bit, you see the next thing in the trajectory of its metabolism is nitrous oxide, which is what the dentist gives you and what they call laughing gas and which gets you very, very high. But we're only talking about nitric oxide. Nitric oxide, the third one down in this metabolism, uh, this uh, chart of the metabolism of nitrates is actually one of the, it's the bomb. This is the reason that people are taking beet juice supplements. This is the reason why they're taking shots of beet juice and all these like powdered beet supplements because it's such a strong source of nitric oxide and nitric oxide lowers blood pressure. It increases circulation. It increases athletic performance. So where did we get this idea that nitrates and nitrites and are bad? They metabolize into one of the most important elements that you can possibly have in the body, which is nitric oxide. Everybody's trying to figure out a good nitric oxide supplement so that we can get more of this stuff into our body. So where's the problem? Well, here's the problem. The problem is that nitrates into nitrites into nitric oxide isn't the only way this, this, this chart of metabolism goes. There's also a little side detour where sometimes the nitrites actually metabolize not into nitric oxide, which is good, but into something called nitrosamines. Those are cancer-causing. Those are not good. And it happens in the presence of two things. Amino acids, which are found in protein, and high heat. And that's why the nitrates and the nitrites in bacon could be a problem. 
because they contain, because bacon is generally <laughs> cooked under high heat. Vegetables are rarely fried at high temperatures, so we really don't have to worry about that. And vegetables don't have much protein, so we don't really have to worry about the amino acids. But with bacon, we've got the amino acids and we've got the high heat, which are two of the conditions that will favor the uh, metabolism of nitrate, nitrites into nitrosamines. Not a good thing. We don't want that. What eliminates that or certainly reduces the risk of that enormously? Vitamin C. When you take vitamin C, your chances of creating nit nitrosamines is greatly reduced. Okay? So let's go back to bacon. I love bacon. Um, and let's talk about why I like bacon. What's so good about bacon? Let's, we've been talking about the potential problems with bacon, of which we've seen there's really only one, which is the nitrates uh, converting into nitrosamines. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in a, in a minute and talk about how to make that safer. But let's talk about what the good stuff is in bacon. So bacon's basically two things, protein and fat, which is, to me, the heart of a good diet. So what does protein do? It stimulates the metabolism. It's the most satiating macronutrient. You feel full much longer when you eat protein. And it's the building block of just about everything. Every biochemical, every hormone, everything, every enzyme, everything in your body is a protein. It comes from this. So, and, and, and actually, the Greek word protein actually comes from uh, of prime importance, which is exactly what it is. And then there's fat. What does fat do? My God, it helps balance hormones. It's good for the brain. And it keeps you full the longest of any of the macronutrients. So the fat and, and protein is where you want to start your day. Now, let's talk about energy. Now, a lot of people don't realize this, but energy, there's a molecule in the body called ATP. See, it's right in the center of that thing. That is your body's Bitcoin, if you will. That's the, that's the cash. That's the currency of energy. You need ATP to blink your eyes, to wash your hands, to dance the macarena, to do just about anything requires ATP. And your body makes ATP every second of every day in the cell, and it makes it from things like glucose, which are carbohydrates, and uh, fatty acids, which is fat. Well, get Guess what? When you make um, ATP from glucose, you get about um, 36 or so uh, molecules of ATP. When you make it from fat, you get about 144 molecules or more, which is exactly why energy is so uh, one is why fat is such a wonderful source of energy. That's why marathoners want to become better butter burners. They want to use up that fat because you can only store about a couple thousand calories of carbohydrate in your body, but you can store 68 gazillion calories of fat. So you want to be able to use that fat for energy. And to be able to use that fat, you have to eat more fat. So let's look at the objections now in light of what we've just talked about with bacon. Number one, saturated fat. I think we blew that one out of the water. It does not cause heart disease. Number two, cholesterol. Lousy predictor and there's not much in it anyway in the bacon, and dietary cholesterol has nothing to do with blood cholesterol. Number three is the nitrates, and as we've seen, nitrates aren't really bad for you. Nitrites aren't really bad for you. They convert to nitric oxide. That's all good. The little bit of a problem there is the high heat and the amino acids, and we'll talk about how to uh, mitigate those risks in just a moment. And finally, we have the objection that all animal products are bad. Well, there's something to this. Uh, I am a big believer that if the only meat I could buy in America were factory farmed, what we call feedlot farmed uh, uh, cows and pigs, uh, horribly, torturously raised um, in large factory farms, fed antibiotics and steroids and bovine growth hormone and every kind of other crap and treated like, if that were the only kind of meat I could buy, I'd become a vegetarian. Luckily, it's not. You can get pastured pork, you can get grass-fed beef, and when you do that, all of these objections just, they fall apart. Because all of the studies that point to any kind of dangers from eating animal products are using the worst kind of animal products on the planet. You know, I live in Southern California. We periodically have an E. coli outbreak, and it's almost always traced to some green leafy vegetable like broccoli or spinach. Well, nobody says that spinach is bad for you. They just say, oh, the stuff got contaminated. Well, that's what's happening with animal products. So when you eat pastured pork, when you eat grass-fed meat, you're eating a health food. It's a whole different animal, no pun intended. So um, this study that came out from the uh, World Health Organization fairly recently, uh, showing that uh, the risk of cancer was increased by 18% when you ate two slices of bacon, once again, first of all, it's a very, very tiny increase. It sounds much worse than it is. Uh, I wrote a blog about this. You can find it on my website. Um, 
about this very specific thing and analyzing what that risk really means. It's, it's tiny in terms of an increase, but it's probably coming from the, the um, conversion to nitrosamines, which we talked about earlier. And I'm going to tell you how to eat bacon safely and reduce even that tiny, tiny little risk or increase in risk. Number one, just get the nitrate and nitrite free. You won't have the extra nitrates that might convert under high heat uh, to some nitrosamines. And this is not even something that I care about as much as I do the other two. Uh, it, it's just if you have it nitrate and nitrite free, there's uh, you have a little bit more flexibility with the cooking, uh, just a little bit more freedom with that. But it's it's not that big a deal. But that's certainly the first thing that you could do. Number two, don't cook at high temperatures. That's the biggie. Don't cook at high temperatures. I actually cook bacon in the microwave. There is a fantastic video on YouTube um, called by Crazy Russian Hacker. You can look it up. And he shows you how to make bacon in a microwave. And it comes out fantastic. You just lay it on a couple of uh, sheets of, of bounty. You know, put it in the microwave for four to five minutes. It comes. It's just wonderful. So just don't cook at high temperatures. And number three, take vitamin C at the same meal. That will reduce even further any possible conversion into nitrosamines and you'll be just fine. And finally, for God's sake and for humanity's sake, eat pasture-raised pork. These are wonderful animals. I'm okay with eating animals. I'm not okay with treating them cruelly. And if you eat organic pasture-raised pork and grass-fed beef, these are animals that are eating their natural diet. They don't get sick. They don't need antibiotics. They're eating organic food. These, they are wonderful health foods when you eat them and they've been properly raised. So that's the stuff I like. Good bacon, not cooked at high temperature, eaten with some good eggs, including those yolks. This, uh, sometimes I'll have it with some oatmeal and some nuts and some raisins, and, and that will be my accompanying dish. Here's what I don't eat bacon with. This stuff. This is the crap that's making us fat, sick, tired, and depressed. The orange juice, the Rice Krispies, the Cheerios, the, the toast. This is the stuff. This is the demon in the diet. It was never fat. It was this stuff. Get rid of this stuff. Go back to the traditional foods and don't fear fat. There's my family. Uh, we all love bacon, especially the three in the middle there. And uh, I want to thank you once again for coming. And I hope that I see you and talk to you very soon.